You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, hey, Foundry, as we dive in today, we're, we're looking into the rhythms of the early church, the things in Acts 2.42 that it says they devoted themselves. They completely gave themselves over to the apostles' teaching, which we know was the word of God, and then uh, the fellowship, so the, the gathering together, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Today, we're going to look into and see how we are called as the church presently to live into this idea and reality of fellowship. But like fellowship, I love clowning church words. It's just, we have weird words in the church. Like, you know, like when people are like, hey, you guys want to go have some fellowship? And you're like, I don't know. That sounds like a disorder. Like, you don't want to have fellowship. You don't know what it is if you're outside the church. And a lot of people outside the church, you know, wouldn't know, like, if it's like, yeah, this is the time we have a sermon. And you're like, is that like Herman's twin brother sermon? Like, you don't know what it means. We have these weird words. If if you ask, like, you know, a disciple, want to be a disciple? Yes. Like, we don't know really what these words mean beyond the church walls. And one of those things that we have in this is the word fellowship. I know this, that um, we at the Foundry have a bunch of rules we don't use. We, we work very hard not to call this uh, what we call the main space here on Main. Um, n- never refer to it as the sanctuary. Because... Outside of here, like people are like sanctuary. Isn't that like where wild animals kind of just hang out and they're safe, like an animal sanctuary? Like we don't really know. And today I'm going to use the word fellowship, oh, just a ton. It's actually a word we've banned, and uh, and we heckle staff. We'll boo them if someone's like, you know, yeah, we were just having fellowship. We're all like boo because you can't use words people don't understand beyond the walls of the church and you can't use them here. But today we're going to take a minute and under, understand within this place what fellowship means, what it means when it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Today we're going to really work on that word and hopefully transition it into its living context. The best way to do that today is to look at and read through the scripture. So today I'm going to invite you to join me. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 through Acts chapter 5 verse 11. It says this. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy people among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses would sell them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, like how's that for a big name? Hi, I'm Joseph, called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, He sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now, chapter 5, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And they sold it with his, he sold it with his wife's full knowledge, and he kept back part of the money for himself. But the rest he brought and put at the apostles' feet. Sounds good, doesn't it? But then Peter says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to human beings, but you have lied to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down dead, and great fear seized all who who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped his body, and carried him out to be buried. About three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, not knowing what had happened, uh, came, came in and Let me start again. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me. The price that you and Ananias got for the land. 
And she said, yes, this is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So um, this is a fun way to start a message on community, right? This, this feels fun. Um, but the reality is there's something going on in both of these texts. I think if we hold them as polar opposites and, and let there be tension in between, what we'll find in this is there's a real purpose of community. This is actually the perfect text for a discussion on genuine community, on community that is more open and real than just you know the common small talk relationships most of us have day in and day out. So when we talk about the, the purpose of community, what I want to do is just recognize the story of Ananias and Sapphira is super shocking. I mean, you couldn't attach a battery to me and make it more shocking. It's just like, ah, oh, wow, but... I want to pay attention to Acts 32 to 37, Acts 4, 32 to 37 first. I want to look into that first and talk about it because what we see in that first community of the church is this humble, um, not, heart, not heart-filled, but it's, it's like they feel They have a a connection to one another that makes them, well, in the end, what I think they are is they are joyfully bound together in life and in mission. They don't hold to what they have. They hold to the gospel because that's all they hold in common. That's all they hold in common. And the reality of this is their humble hearts and their love for one another shows that they are literally one body of people, one group of people that has many parts. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 26, he talks about one body having many parts. And I think this is critical to understand the early church because when you see one body working together well, when it's working together well, it's, well, we pay a lot of money to go to sporting events, not to watch the unathletic perform, right? Nobody's there to see the guy next to you who weighs, you know, like 500 pounds eating nachos all day and screaming about how the quarterback can't do his thing or whatever, right? We're there to watch the athletes. When you, when you watch tennis, which to me is one of the more nimble, those people are athletes, Like, tennis players are crazy. When you look at, like, a Serena Williams and the way she moves, like, fluid around that court, and she can run like she's being chased by a lion, stop on a dime and swat a little ball that big around right to the pinpoint she wanted to at 80 miles an hour across the court, there's part of it that you're just like, she's so awesome. It's, it's so much fun. It's so cool to watch Serena Williams play the game she's so good at. She's, she's a whole body working together. And like, I mean, that girl is jacked. She's like tough, right? She's, I mean, she could swap me across the room. She's, she is an athlete put together for one purpose. And then there's the other things we watch that are a little bit flash in the pan. I don't know, did anybody here ever watch Wipeout? Yeah, remember that show? Oh, it was so magical. It didn't last super long because in the end, nobody wants to watch someone literally kick themselves in the back of the head when they fall. I saw that happen on Wipeout. I saw a lady, uh, she was jumping across these giant red balls and she messed up and her foot came up and kicked her in the back of the head. And I'm like, oh, like, do you know the spinal injury that causes Like, if I tried to get my leg up there, I would literally be shipped immediately to a hospital. And they would just be like, there's not much we can do. You were not meant to bend that way, right? When you look at Wipeout, you're like, that is not a body fine-tuned and working together in unity. That is a garbage fire of a lot of pain, you know? It just doesn't look the same. And I think what we see in the early church is this lean, muscular, athletic church body 
that is all working together for one singular purpose, the glory of Jesus Christ through the unity of the body and for the proclamation of the gospel. When we see them doing this, we can understand that these people actually had to be lean, had to be like that athlete because for them, when they came to Jesus on Pentecost Sunday, they lost everything. They left normal Jewish society and became part of what would have been called then a sect of of, uh, a different religion. They would have been outside the covenant family and they would have been kicked out Back then, there was no social umbrella. They would have lost everything to follow Jesus. So they gave everything to one another. All their purposes and efforts went towards that. And I think for us, we need to understand for for our idea of community, the humble hearts and the calling to be one body for one purpose, working all together for the glory of Christ. That's why the Foundry Church is not against any other church or ministry. We are for them. We celebrate when other churches grow. We think it's a blessing of God that the other members of the body grow. That's a great thing. We're not in competition. We're in unity. And that's how the early church would have understood the purpose of community, to all work together for the glory of Christ. They would have been gifted differently for the glory of Jesus. There would have been people like there are here who are gifted for hosting, right? They're gifted for hosting. There's people who are gifted for teaching. There's people who are gifted for more relational one-on-one ministry. There's people gifted for more administrative gifts, right? You don't want me administrating anything. That's just not my gift. It's actually would harm people. But I'm gifted for my thing. And when we look at this, we understand the unity of the body matters. But then we have to then juxtapose this beautiful picture of the humble early church that served for the glory of Jesus. Let's hold that and then let's look at the story of what fake fellowship looks like. What does fake fellowship look like? Well, I think it's important that we ask a question first. Let's ask this. What did Ananias and Sapphira do so wrong? What did they do that was so terribly wrong? They sold a piece of land, and it sounds like they gave most of the money to the apostles, which seems very generous But the reality of this is, is that, well, this is a a note taken out of the Jesus Bible, which I, I love, and it says this. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira was this, that they lied about their gift and withheld money for themselves. Now catch this but they desired the status of a a large donation and the appearance of radical generosity in the eyes of the apostles and other members of the church. They wanted to appear as though they were all in by being only about 90% in. Who did Jesus bang on in his ministry all the time? The Pharisees, who looked good on the outside, but Jesus said, you are whitewashed tombs. You're a tomb that's been painted, and on the inside, you're dead. And in the early church, it really comes down to the church would not tolerate hypocrisy, Pharisees, people who act one way, but on the inside are completely, totally different. And on um, outside of the religious setting, they behave completely different. Furthermore, Peter says that Ananias and Sapphira allowed Satan to fill their hearts. They lied to the Holy Spirit who had filled the individual community of the believers. In the midst of the church's miraculous growth, remarkable unity, and amazing gospel message, Ananias and Sapphira's deceitful plan stood as the antithesis of the church's faith-filled generosity and brotherly love. Because it was a self-centered, self-seeking thing. I'm going to do this good for the church, but I'm going to do it inside of everybody. I'm going to look like one thing while holding a little back for myself. And it tells us this. When When we talk about fellowship, when we talk about it being fake, what we're looking at is if you're not willing to engage and go all in and be all in for Jesus Christ, then there is part of you that is deceiving the fellowship. There's a part of you that makes 
um, this not a safe place because you want to appear one way, but you want to keep a little something on the side. You want to keep a little for yourself. And what we have to do is we have to look at not just how messed up Ananias and Sapphira are, but we have to look at and understand how you and I succumb to fake fellowship, right? Because if we're honest, it's fun to look at Ananias and Sapphira and be like, man, you guys are bad. Who messes up the early church? Peter was there. John was there. The disciples were there. How are you that bad, right? But here's the deal. We're the same. We're the same. We don't like to believe that, but we are the same. And so let's look at just a few ways we partake, participate, partake. That's a church word. Boo. All right. Um, th- let's look at how you and I participate in a false fellowship. How about fake humility and teachability? Where you're sitting maybe in church, you're like, mm, that's a good word. I plan on using none of it. But yeah, in church, I'm gonna, yeah, whoa, yeah, ooh, preach all day. I like that scripture here, but not out there. So you look good. You maybe come off very humble and very teachable. But in the end, you're constantly conspiring for how you can advance your status, either in a community, in a business, in any kind of relationship. A false humility or false teachability that says, hey, I'm an open book. You know, just challenge me. I want to grow upwards. And the whole time you're scheming of how to get away and find a ladder up and not do the hard work of growing. The next thing we can look at is um, a refusal to engage. This is a big one. And I'm gonna speak to us as a church. If you're visiting, at least you'll know the rules of fellowship. (laughs) I don't mean it harsh, but I do mean it to be very blunt. When we talk about um, refusal to engage, engagement matters in our church. You can come, uh, let me say this, attendance is an engagement. Attendance is coming, and I love that we attend and taking, but engagement is being part of the healthy body. It's not some little thing that just comes in and out and only takes, it actually contributes and participates in the healthy, life-giving part of the body. One of the ways we succumb, one of the ways we fall into fake fellowship is we think, yeah, I go to church, but the question isn't do you go to church, the question is are you the church? Do you come and engage Do you give generously of yourself in your time, in your treasure, in your talents? This church needs to be generous with its time, giving for one another's benefit. For what? Not for me, not for the building, not for any of that. For the glory of Jesus Christ. Give, you've been gifted by God to do certain things. Employ those gifts for Jesus' glory. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a while, but the next thing we see is this, deceitful use of our values. We have values in this church, and there are things that go on that are deceitful uses of the values. Courageous obedience can be deceitfully used, where you manipulate something to look one way, but you already had a guaranteed outcome. And we believe that for us as a church, we take risks without guaranteed outcomes because the Spirit of God doesn't always promise us the ending. He only calls us to an obedience. And so when we look at our own values, we can say, you know, transformation. Oh, man, transformation is one of the ways we can be so deceitful. If you're going to be in fellowship in this church, we believe you are not who you're supposed to be yet. I am not who I'm supposed to be yet. We are to be transformed into the image of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit and courageous obedience. And God does the work of transforming us, but we can look the part on the outside, right? We can Ananias and Sapphira that all day. We can look so good on the outside and have nothing changing in here. Transformation is not an outward deal. It actually works its way from the inside out. You can see a change on someone radiating out of them sometimes, but in the end, if you put the transformation over the shell, it always fades. It'll need a new application of spiritual makeup to make it look nice. So we understand that's a big deal. We can't have deceitful use of the values. We become like Christ or 
we deceive the world around us to just look like it. The next thing is, maybe, um, here's a good one, maybe you're really nice to people in church. Maybe you even do this when you see someone, you're like, good to see you, brother. And you're all nice, you're kind, hello, sister. You talk to people all sweetly. But in the end, you go out into that world and you're cruel, you're cold-blooded, there's nothing kind or, or of the fellowship of Christ in you beyond these walls. That is falling into the same trap Ananias and Sapphira did. It's a false fellowship. But it tells us this, that broken relationships, necessary endings, and restoration are part of the church community. Don't get me wrong. There was huge disagreements in the early church. There were arguments and people almost, I mean, Peter almost came to blows with a few people. Don't get me wrong, this is a passionate thing, but the fact is the unity, oh man, unity is primary in the church. But it doesn't mean there isn't conflict, it means there's godly conflict. Barnabas, in, in verse uh, 36 and 37 of uh, Acts 2.42, it's like Joseph from Cyprus, also known as Barnabas, you know, the son of encouragement, he sold a field and he bought that he sold the field and he brought the money to the apostles' feet. Like, how good is he? Did you know Barnabas and Paul got into a fight? And they got into such a severe conflict that they parted ways. They literally quit hanging out with one another on the mission field. Here's what it says. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, this is in um, Acts 15, 36 to 41. Sometimes later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Like that seems like Paul to me. Let's go to all the towns we visited. And Barnabas is like, I'm tired. No, but here's what it says. Barnabas wanted to take John, also known as Mark, with them. But Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because he, John Mark, had deserted them in Pamphylia. And he had not continued with them in the work they were doing. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cecilia, uh, strengthening the churches. They had a disagreement so severe, they decided to split ways and go their own separate ways. Necessary endings, right? But sometimes God allows these things to move us where we're supposed to be. But our hearts must remain soft. We can't be bitter and hardened against people. We can't choose to hate people because they did something we don't like. Both of these men, Paul and Barnabas continued faithfully in ministry for the Lord. And I want you to look at, or at least hear these words from Colossians, the book of Colossians, written to the church of Colossae, written by Paul to the church in Colossae. And he has an interesting little phrase at the end of the book, and I think you'll like it. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, wishes to be remembered to you, as does Mark, the relative of Barnabas. You received instructions concerning him. So you think, ooh, Paul's gonna drop the hammer. Don't let him in your houses. He's a bad guy. No, that's not what he says. He says, you received instructions concerning him. If he comes to you, give him a welcome. But there's an asterisk by this. What, 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 there's a descriptive, an, an adjective that says what kind of welcome he wants. He wants a hearty welcome. He wants, um, he wants a welcome that's like when you run to your granddad when you're little and he picks you up and just whoosh, a hearty welcome. He's been waiting for you. He says to them, when Barnabas gets there, you scoop him up and you hug him and you love on him like he is a long lost relative. Take care of Barnabas. You don't say that about, about people you are bitter at. His heart was still soft. Even though they had a disagreement, it didn't break the unity of the faith. Actually, I think it was one of the best gifts to the early church because Barnabas, who was called, and Paul, who was called, went their separate ways with other disciples to do the work of the kingdom. And quite often, it's much more fun to stay with the people you like. And God sometimes brings us to necessary endings for the glory of Jesus Christ. This very strong verb of a welcome that Paul instructed them to give shows his soft heart. 
But we have to now look and understand that we in the church are called to this soft-hearted doing good, just doing good, caring for the other believers in the world around us and the world beyond our borders, doing good for the glory of Jesus Christ. I want to read to you, uh, and I know we're bouncing through a lot of scriptures, but I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 6, six verses 1 to 10. And I want you to hear the wood, words of Paul, and I want you to hear them through um, the voice of Eugene Peterson, who translated the New Testament and the Old Testament in a version called The Message. Okay, so it's not an exact lined up translation. It gives it some living language, and I think you'll enjoy it as well. Listen to this when it comes to fellowship. Live creatively, friends. I like that right out of the gates. Live creatively. Don't do the same thing all the time. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. You might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. Stoop down. Reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens. And so complete Christ's law. If you think you're too good for that, you are badly deceived. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given, and then sink yourself into that. Do you catch that? Share one another's burdens, but also be aware of your work and do it. What does that tell you? This isn't an individual effort. It says, share one another's burdens, but don't forget you're accountable for the work you're called to. Get to work, but do it together. This isn't an isolated thing. I, I just love that. All right. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Be very sure now. You who have been trained to a self-sufficient maturity that you enter into a generous, common life with those who have trained you, sharing all the good things that you have and experience. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. In, in my translation in my head is... Um, don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. If you remember that translation, that's what this is. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. It's spring in Michigan right now. And farmers are worried that they can't plant because it's just rain. Everything's wet and soft. You got to get the harvest in the ground long before it grows. You plant for a harvest. And that's what he says. That's what he, what he talks about is the person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All they will have to show for their life is weeds. But one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life, of, of eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit right now. Therefore, every time we get the chance or opportunity, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. The community of faith. What is the community of faith? It's the fellowship. It's the deep abiding relationships we have within the body of Christ and we share together for one thing, to get the message of Jesus Christ into the world beyond these walls and bring them into the fellowship that people don't walk this road alone. We have to look at this thing that, um, I, I, like, I like how my wife said it, fellowship economics. Erica said that and I was like, that is a great phrase. Fellowship economics. There is an economics. There is actual hard data to say what it costs to be in relationship. Relationships are costly, and we get it. We understand that. But the question is, we need to understand opportunity cost, right? If you want to have a six-pack and be all shredded for summer, there's an opportunity to have a you know, McDonald's any time of day, but the cost will be your goal, 
right? There's certain things. You've got to feed a certain way to have a certain look if you want that. You've, if you want to retire and go to Florida at 50, you're going to have to live a certain way for a lot of years in order to empower that to happen. There's opportunity cost. You take this opportunity and it costs you another thing. So here's my question for you. If there's an opportunity cost of fellowship economics that goes on in church, we have to count the cost of being in relationship as a church. <clears throat> and understand, in the Foundry Church, our goal is to get you in a relationship with Jesus Christ, in a relationship with people in the church, in groups, and into worship. That's what we want. We want you in the weekly rhythm. We want you in the word of God, knowing Jesus Christ, studying his word, and a life of prayer. We want you in worship, and we want you in groups. And all those things are centered around the word of God, around God speaking. So will you engage yourself in this, or will you engage on God's term? Because if you engage yourself, you will chase your passions and desires. But if you engage on God's term, terms, you will count the cost. And you will find a way to leave certain things behind to, to share in the fellowship, the unity, the relationships that God offered us in the early church right up to the present day. <clears throat> to have community, or let's say it this way, to have deeper relationships like in groups, you have to give something up probably. If you're gonna be in a group, you might have to bail on your Tuesday night bowling league to be in a Tuesday night group. Opportunity cost. If you want to grow in the fellowship, it may cost you something else you do. Or it may cost you just not being in front of the TV one night that week. I don't know what the cost is for you. I can just tell you this. If you want to have community, fellowship, a deepening of relationships, you're probably going to have to give up something on a night that you maybe didn't want to. On a day where maybe you're like, oh, I'd rather just go home. But God calls us to the fellowship, to the engagement of relationships in the church. So you have to count the cost and say, am I willing to do that on that night? To give generously, you may have to wait for that thing you want. But to be faithful to what God called the church to do. And I'll say this to us as a church. For a church like us who is growing, I want to challenge you. Pick a percentage and give to the church you love. Don't excuse yourself from being generous to this church. We are called, if you're attending here, if you're a member here, we are calling you to generosity. Pick a percentage of your life income and give to the church you love. If you love what's going on here, give to, to it. And make, it's gonna be a cost. You're gonna have to lose something else. We understand that balance in our personal home. It, it's opportunity cost. It's the economics of fellowship. Don't say you want community and then offer no relationship. Here's the thing I know. It's Mother's Day. And no one understands opportunity cost and fellowship economics like a mom, in my opinion. A servant-hearted mom. If you go pick a, your child up or if you have a kid and like dance or something, just go to the parking lot and look and look in the different cars around there and look at what the dads are doing. Most of them probably just chilling out, slaying it on Fruit Ninja, you know, just kind of chilling out. You got a few minutes, just waiting. Some of them are asleep. You look in a car with a mom in it, she's got like a laptop open, a thing of laundry going in the back and she's cooking something on a hot plate in the car because she has eight minutes and she's going to have dinner ready and the kids will have clothes for tomorrow. And she's going to pick them up from swimming and then we're going to head home and we're all going to be together for a while. Right? Moms understand opportunity cost. They make the most of it. And I'm not saying dads don't, but I think moms need to be loved and revered for their willingness to surrender so much of themselves for so much of us. They teach us opportunity cost. Right? Maybe, maybe I know a lot of moms who get invited out to go do something and they say no because they know they've been busy with other things and they want to be at home with their kids that night. Or they want to be at home with their spouse. Or maybe they just need a night away to be in the word of God because they've been running too hard. And they look at it and they're like, no, I'm not going to ignore and push things to the side. I'm going to put in the middle what is in the middle, my relationships. I see moms do this all the time. They trade an easy night out with a tougher night at home for the investment in relationship. 
they multitask to all of our benefits. I was talking to a mom the other day who was sitting at a track meet with the window down, her laptop open. She's working while listening, and when it's like final call for like long jump, close it, run into the thing, watch her kid jump. They come over, good job, honey. They go out to talk to their friends and ignore her in the middle of the field, rude, but they do that. She goes back to the car, tunes her ear in, waiting for, I don't know, the 200. Final call for the 200, closes the laptop, walks back in, watches the race, congratulates them at the end of their race and says, all right, I'm going to head home. They go home, get dinner ready. So that when the kid comes home, he's like, oh, I've had such a long day. And they don't go, really, have you? Have you? They're like, oh, I know you did good. And they give and give and give. Fellowship, it's not about you. It's about what you give. It's about relationship. I invite you. I invite you to be a church that understands that sometimes a messy house is okay because you chose relationship over cleaning. I would rather have a messy church. Please don't hear that, Pam. But I would rather have a messy church than to have a really clean church with no one in it. Relationship is messy. Fellowship is messy. But I'll tell you this. Somehow, the one defining trait of the church is this. Love one another as I have loved you. That's what Jesus said. And in fellowship, we are given the rich opportunity to do so. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and we thank you for who you are. And we ask that you would bless us with your presence, with your spirit, and that you would guard us and keep us. Lord, forgive us for the times where we believe that we don't need relationship and deepening connection and call us upwards into yourself that we may be tender, soft, and responsive to you. God, help us to love one another as you have loved us. Help us to have unity as a primary by getting ourselves out of the middle and putting you right in the dead center of it all. May you be at the center of all things, receiving the praise and the glory of your church. In Jesus' name. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.